fortunate, I think, to be able to do this uh, with uh, Professor Robert Duffman here, um, uh, Bob Duffman with the bow tie in the middle there, who uh, was my teacher at, um, at Princeton and um, has a particular view of the shape of the uh, changing American architecture profession, which I think he's expressed extremely well in his uh, recent book, um, which I think is quite, as I'll try to develop in a few moments, quite a, um, um, a threatening and, uh, and disturbing perspective uh, to traditional, traditionally minded architects. Um, the point about this evening is that it's meant to be a discussion, uh, and that um, I hope quite quickly we'll uh, lose formality and uh, begin to bring in different points of view from the uh, rather heterogeneous collection of people who got here, some of whom are, are patrons, and some of whom are architects, and some of whom are somewhere in between. Uh, it would help, I think, as we develop into the evening, because we're trying to record this, if each time you speak, even if you've spoken before, it would be good if you just remember to announce your name and uh, if you want uh, where you come from, who you are, and what you do. The topic is um, patronage. Uh, and to me, that's always been a word that is full of slightly creepy connotations. Uh, it doesn't quite ring true. It has a, um, a disturbing um, undertone to it uh, of dependency on the one hand and of superiority on the other. And the relationship between architects and their clients, uh, certainly in my own experience, I think is edgy uh, at its best. It's always, uh, it's always a, a, a dangerous uh, interface between the, uh, the supplier and the consumer. And there's a, a certain fantasy about um, uh, the architect having artistic autonomy uh, and yet being dependent upon the person who actually uh, pays the bill. And there's a certain condescension uh, in a broader sense of the uh, relation of the architect to be his, uh, uh, his consumers, a certain condescension uh, which is uh, also allied with uh, um, when it suits the bleakest indifference uh, to the fate of the people who suffer buildings. Now, I don't think this would uh, particularly matter. This has been the history of the, um, uh, of the architecture profession for, um, since the profession was established in the uh, beginning of the 19th century in this country. And it's always been uh, a little difficult if you're uh, Mr. Pecksniff and you have to cope with uh, difficult clients. But what I sense at the moment is that uh, the normal way in which this issue has been debated, which um, uh, certainly in the United States and I think in this country has been about a divergence between the uh, profession, uh, people out there on the other side of Bedford Square, and the schools, uh, places like this, that divergence which sometimes comes <coughs> together and sometimes uh, comes apart. When, when, I, when I was here, it was actually rather close, and I think the distance between the active profession and the uh, school is probably as wide now as it ever has been in, in, uh, ever, probably. But I think there's another divergence, which is between the um, architecture, which is the sum of all architecture activities in education and practice, the sum of that and reality, uh, an increasing divergence that the fantasies we have, both in schools and in practice, do not correspond uh, in any way to the reality of uh, the world uh, around us. Um, there are various reasons for that, reasons for that which um, uh, I, I, I just want to mention very briefly. Um, in the, um, the, um, the, the way in which the, the, the RBA, uh, based upon the wonderful research that was done in the early 60s about uh, uh, the relationship between the architect and his client, the architect in his office, um, various uh, maxims were established at that time, one of which, um, which is still appears in the conditions of engagement with architect's appointment, uh, which is the advice, good advice in a certain political sense, that they, um, there should always be one point of contact with the client, uh, and that point of contact should be rather carefully managed. But of course, clients aren't uh, 
um, monolithic. They're incredibly complicated uh, political institutions in their own right, uh, changing, shifting, uh, making their, uh, dealing with time, dealing with the, the, the turbulent environment within which they work. Uh, many headed, and how can an architect possibly cope uh, with that reality by one perfect medium of one imperfect project manager? It's impossible. Um, and of course, another uh, problem is the increasing elaboration of the design process. Uh, the huge number of uh, experts of one kind or another who are involved in making design decisions uh, who are somehow supporting uh, the architect uh, as he carries out his supposedly lonely task. In fact, it's a very overcrowded task. And just to make things even more complicated, and particularly in this city at this time, is the uh, phenomenon of the internationalization of the uh, architectural profession, uh, the, which is so very clearly evident in the, um, uh, the entry of new kinds of service, new kinds of architects, uh, new kinds of boundaries which go well beyond those which were, are defined by the Royal Institute of British Architects. So the relationship with the client, um, in terms of the complexity of the client, the complexity of the architectural process itself, and the complexity of the world in which we live is being renegotiated all the time. And I think you can see that extremely clearly um, if you look at the shape of the city and the kinds of buildings that are being built in the city and how they uh, represent a kind of global reality rather than a local uh, reality. Now, here we have an incredibly complicated situation, as I see it, from, from my particular corner of the uh, architectural profession. And it seems to me extremely um, remote from the idea of the, the lonely artist uh, in the attic, in the atelier, uh, waiting for the cardinal's servant to come creeping up the wooden staircase with the Great Commission for the, uh, the, the new building. That um, sort of simple relationship, uh, that wonderful ability to be able to exercise all those artistic skills for the benefit of an enlightened, all-seeing, uh, noble patron is fantasy, uh, absent fantasy. And I think this point is beautifully uh, illustrated in Bob Gutman's book, uh, where he draws a picture of the architectural profession in the United States, which is extremely similar to the architectural profession in this country, where there's a curve which demonstrates that um, there are a very, very large number of very, very small practices indeed, and a very small number of very large practices which command um, um, probably about a third of the work that's being, that's being carried out in the United States. So, Firms of enormous complexity, enormous sophistication comparatively, uh, juxtaposed with uh, a large number of architects who are behaving for one reason or another in something like the traditional way. And the second thing that uh, Bob Gutman points out in his book, which struck me um, as absolutely having the ring of truth, was that of all professions, um, and given this uh, huge disparity between the, the great and the little, of all professions, architects uh, contain these days the highest number of disappointed and disaffected people who are not being given or able to enjoy the stardom that was promised to them in the studios in schools like this. So that, I think, is a cruel uh, phenomenon, a cruel piece of reality, which uh, is part of this fantasy that uh, we have woven for ourselves. And I think the task of this evening um, is to explore this reality, this interface between um, the people who serve and the people who command. Uh, and what I would like to investigate uh, with you all this evening is what model of patronage uh, would be appropriate, would be relevant uh, for this uh, new and highly complex situation in which we find ourselves. And uh, is it possible, or is there something absolutely contradictory about uh, such a model, can it lead, um, or should it lead, uh, automatically to good, whatever that is, architecture? Um, and if so, what are the rules? Um, what are the rules that should guide patronage, that should uh, 
help those who consume architecture uh, to uh, help those who uh, provide it. And what kind of discourse is possible? Uh, intellectual discourse, and I must say also, a, dis a sociological discourse, a discourse about power, uh, who actually is in control at which stage of the process, um, under whose command, uh, and it changes, as those who know the architectural design process uh, very well understand, from one side of the fence to the other as projects develop. Um, is there, uh, in an infallible way, is there an easy way of organizing the system, the relationship between uh, patron and architect uh, that results in the kind of quality environment that ought to be appropriate for uh, great cities like this in turbulent times? I think these are very difficult questions, and I don't want to um, uh, take up any more time, but I, I would like to uh, immediately open the discussion up uh, to uh, you all uh, to see whether we can throw any light on this and whether we can uh, perhaps develop at the end of the season some general conclusions. What I'm going to ask for government to do is to try to hold the threads leading together right, and, and to, to uh, come in more to the end than the beginning so he can, he can sum up and uh, use the benefit of his perspective, North American perspective, to uh, perhaps throw a little bit of light, light upon our, our conditions here. So that's, uh, that's the start. Um, Roland, would you like to, to open the discussion? <laughs> Uh, I'll run the links to yes, quite. Um, <coughs> my name is Roland Schlick. I work for a small property company that has a development section. You may have heard of it, it's called MEPC. Um, Frank's uh, general invitation here is in the form of a letter which has a series of these questions really summarized. <coughs> Uh, I'd just like to mention them because you don't have the benefit of the text, but two questions are who is the client and who is the architect? And I'd just attempt to say a few words about uh, how we might, in the development section of the company that I'm concerned with, define that. And I think the first answer of who is the client is a very simple one in that the client is the person who has a financial stake in the operation uh, that he's determined to protect. And that is actually something which I think is commonly misunderstood by the architectural profession to the extent that it is applicable to the project in that that applies to the whole project, to the land holding, to its acquisition, to the problems that are associated with the capital investment that that represents, right the way through to the time that the operation is going to take to complete. And I suppose that immediately brings us into the first problem we have with architects in the time they take to deliver us the product or get it to the builder for construction. Uh, and the complexity of those issues is something, having taught in schools of architecture, I would like to see addressed very much more the actual financial understanding of the structure of the client and how he might perceive uh, that which he is trying to create. Uh, it's a very simple definition for starters and it may or may not be too cliché for your purposes. Who is the architect, I think, is a more interesting question. And whilst we are commissioning architects all the time and giving a great deal of care and consideration to who they might be, I think Frank's question is harder to answer than it would first appear. Um, you can answer it traditionally by simply referring to uh, people who have identified themselves as having design skills so-called of one sort and another and who finally put their name to the building as it were. I'm not sure that that is acceptable in the long term anymore. Um, I really see the architect 
and his function as being perhaps having an idea of the implication of the next building that might be there, wherever it is. Not necessarily on the site that he is being asked to look at for our particular purposes, but perhaps on either side of it or something. In other words, someone whose ideas are really based not with the specific problem that we have set, but with the broader implications of that problem. And I think that would apply to um, the so-called Greenfield site and or the inner city site. In other words, I think an architect now must really be working at some sort of limit of imagination which makes the act of building possible and not just the provider of solutions to uh, not such short-term objectives that we might have, but to those readily definable abstract issues of uh, so much gross, so much net floor space, and so many stories, etc., etc. I'd, I'd like to stop you. similarities and differences between, b b between then and now. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'll run through this. M my Lord, I'm honoured with your letter dated 7th instant and shall wait for Mr. Doe's full account of all matters requisite at the present concerning the building, both at ye mausoleum and also the North Front of ye house, which you mentioned about the basement to be rusticated. I humbly observed to your Lordship, touching the North Front, that it was intended, much in the same style as Mr. Inigo Jones, and Mr. Webb intended for the King's Palace at Greenwich, now turned into an hospital, viz. that the basement and ground plinth upon which all the superstructure was to be deposited should be plain and appear one solid stone or rock, the better to distinguish the upper order as well as to sustain it. He goes on. South side and the north front of your Lordship's house cannot be seen together at the same time, nor at, uh, nor at any time upon the diagonal or angular view. <laughs> And though ye south front is rusticated in the basement, yet the order upon its plane, but divided into a per perpetual arcade, supported with a range of pilasters, by which the contrast and dispar between the basement and the order become more visibly remarkable. And it's most certain that when a machine is composed of different parts, limbs or members, one wouldn't have them blend and melt into one mass so as not to be able to distinguish ye noble parts from the inferior, the basement from the order that rests upon it, or, as in the human bodies, the trunk and the limbs. The north front is of the Doric order rusticated, except in the basement, which is plain and represents, or intended, say, to do, a grand entire plinth made out of one solid rock of stone, and ought not to be subdivided, and cannot, without hurting ye beauty and strength of ye building. The same may be said of ye office wing at the east side of the court, where the order is all rusticated, standing upon a grand plain plinth of stone. 
So the state of UK stands thus, viz. the south front is smooth in the upper order with a continual arcade and the basement rusticated. Per contra, the north front is rusticated restica in the order and so is the wing and the basement like a solid rock quit plain and I do not apprehend how we can mend them by any alteration. I am sorry to say it is with reluctancy I see some alterations that I wish had never been. <laughs> now, and this, and this in a way is the point that's relevant to the discussion and terribly poignant, I think. Now, with, now, notwithstanding, I have thus impudently expressed myself. I must submit to your Lordship's better reason and fancy in this affair, which is your own. I am never out of humour with any of that does not think as I do, and much less with your Lordship, who must govern the case. I, I, he goes on a bit more, but it seems to me that that is extremely relevant to this discussion, shifted a few centuries. And, and it's such, such irony, uh, such uh, it is Lordship reply. Well, it is, it's probably isn't in the text that I had. <laughs> Actually, I was going to ask Vincent, it's very unfair, how you would reply to such a letter. In, uh, in <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> How do you reply, Vincent? Well, I think there's a whole question about Sorry, patronage. Sorry, you should say it to Patronage is a sort of um, Renaissance idea or maybe a you know, high Victorian idea, and it implies being patronising and having to throw yourself on the mercy of you know, your client and what his decision is and so forth. And it's not a relationship of equals, and I think it's an inappropriate word to use today. Um, maybe in the Medici was, as you say, an, an enlightened noble who, you know, pro bono publico or whatever you like, decided to make great works of architecture. The Victorian, on the other hand, really had, an, I suppose, an enlightened self-interest in the whole affair. Um, I don't think that today those of us who build a lot have, you know, I think we have a completely different approach. Um, ours particularly is that good architecture is good business, that it's not something which is to be regarded as extra, and that architecture is not something that's skin deep, it goes all the way through, and it's all about the way a building is conceived, put together the way it meets its projected user's needs, um, and there has to be an equal relationship and a mutual respect between the, not only the, uh, the client and the architect, but all others who are involved. And in our particular field of speculative development, we're considering the user and the community at large. And it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. There are other people involved. Um, the office building in the city cannot be a sort of isolated monument, a sort of machine for making money any longer. And I think that's a good thing. Um, there is an uh, issue, if you like, with developer architecture that with an unknown user, there is a tendency for it to be skin deep, and I think that's one of the difficulties and one of the challenges we face. I think it can be overcome, but it, I would say it's easier to take on a commission for an owner-occupier who has ideas of corporate grandeur that he can indulge in, maybe hubris that you know he wants to project in, in the commission. Uh, we can't indulge those things, and I think it makes it all the harder. Um, the architect, on the other hand, you say, who is the architect, I think also has to readjust his sights and has to recognise, I believe, that he's not the traditional omni-expert, omnipotent sort of expert in everything. He's the design team leader, he has a very important role to play, but he can't have all the answers. And he has to understand that other people also have a very significant role to play and he's a member of a team. Oh, actually, I, I'd like to go back to, to just to, to the very interesting point that uh, John Thackeray raised, um, and whether there's anything inherently different between society today and say in the uh, 17th century um, in terms of the program of the architect in relation to the, to the user. I mean, example, a fascinating example, which shows an enormous level of organisation, ability, and sophistication, uh, and uh, uh, the use of architecture to express ideas um, is the. Uh, the building campaign of the Jesuits in, the, in Czechoslovakia and uh, Bohemia in the, in the 17th century, where a, uh, an architecture was used in order to uh, assert the power of the church and to, um, to push the boundaries of the, 
uh, Counter-Reformation forward. Now, that's uh, a pretty uh, elaborate use of artistic resources in order to achieve a great uh, uh, end of state. Um, I think actually it is inherently different, complex, uh, sophisticated it is, to what actually happens in one of uh, Vincent's buildings, uh, which is uh, um, designed as elegantly uh, as possible uh, for a particular sector of, of the market and deliberately um, leaves a whole set of decisions about its being uh, to those who actually inhabit it, who come later with other designers, uh, uh, the interior being so vastly important, uh, whose uh, time uh, objectives are so short in relation to that of the building, um, who will make all kinds of decisions and make, make challenge, in fact, the, the shell and uh, do it in a way that it have, uh, hopefully complements but probably uh, contradicts. And uh, assembling vast amounts of, uh, of, of physical stuff in order to meet the uh, the day-to-day -day <coughs> highly politicized needs of changing organization when no one is really in charge. Uh, and that is <coughs> that, map, that opening of, the, of architecture, uh, artistic decisions to immediate mass consumption that seems to, to me to have made an enormous difference. The churches in Bohemia and Czechoslovakia are still there morning <coughs> with the same message. But the buildings that Vincent is building now uh, in 40 years' time will be occupied by different organizations with different technologies, with different values, and uh, will you know, be a totally different kind of entity. In fact, so different that I begin to wonder whether the word building uh, is an entity at all, whether, whether you know, one can actually use in the traditional way the idea of a building as a, as, a, as a useful term in this situation, because we're not talking about buildings, we're talking about a pattern of use and an adaptation of buildings which transcends uh, conventional architecture. We've pulled down more than one building uh, less than 20 years old. Yes. <coughs> yes, I, I'd just like to say that, um, to be specific, the point that I was trying to make I think was well covered by Vincent in that I see the whole of the broad gate issue as providing that very possible environment in which to build. Now, it's not to say that you couldn't knock some of them down to start again, not quite at the moment. But in other words, it provides an urban framework which one can believe can go on. And, and the problem that um, I think that it deals with is the problem that you see demonstrated in London Wall, where the decisions that were made by the people at the time have left the subsequent generation, which is ourselves, nowhere to go but to rip it down and start again. And I think that is not a valid architectural principle. And uh, that is, in fact, what is happening. Richard? Well, I'm just trying to think about what, you, what you said. But it's Richard, I'm quite high enough to. I, I'm sort of rather searching for ways of phrasing this, but I think till fairly recently, historically, or even very recently, historically, um, social conduct, including um, building, um, was um, much to do with symbolic behavior. Um, and uh, buildings uh, were heavily symbolic and metaphorical. Um, I mean, I'm kind of rather curious example of metaphor and, and, and the use of what we call decoration. I, mean, I was recently in Stockholm and saw the vast ship, which is absolutely sort of layered with um, symbolic statuary. And the idea of the thing wasn't just to fire guns, but it was sort of you floated this thing out at your enemies, and they were supposed to reel with the symbolism and go away. Um, and uh, architecture, I'm sure, was, was like that until till recently, and, and I didn't quite know why it's not anymore, but it certainly was during most of the 19th century, and certainly the battle of the styles, and all, the whole matter of, of, of the buildings which be Gothic or classical <coughs> was a continuation of that kind of thing. I mean, the only, it's odd that we seem to have sort of sanitized that conveniently, so it doesn't carry, um, need to carry this kind of baggage around with it, which is what art has been abandoned to, I think, very much. And it's curious that the only way that we all suddenly get urgently concerned with it is when the, um, the uh, ant of the throne suddenly raises it, and it suddenly becomes intensely real again for a lot of people. Peter Pittman. Um I'm, I'm Peter Pittman. I'm, I'm an architect. Um, just to perhaps I could respond in a different way to John Ackroyd, if I hope I understood him correctly. 
because it, it seems to me that architects still do play from some of the things that are said and one wouldn't believe it but architects do still play a very central role um, <coughs> I've often been with at meetings with a number of people from bankers to structural engineers to quantity surveyors and we've been sat round a table and there's been a building, an exciting project about to commence and the discussion tends to peter out at a certain point because the only person who can actually start this whole thing off it seems to me is actually the architect doing a very simple thing which is to make a few marks on paper and conceive a form which is going to actually suit, begin to suit the multitude of requirements that the, all, all the other people are going to feed into it. Now I'm too extremely unhappy about this word patronage. Um, I think it's a rather sloppy use of the word. Um, I took the trouble to look it up in the dictionary and patron is according to the shorter Oxford dictionary one who countenances, protects, or gives influential support. I then went, because actually I don't write many letters to patrons, to be frank, as a practicing architect. I write most of them to clients. And client, says the shorter Oxford Dictionary, is using the services of a professional man. Now I happen to think of myself as a professional man. And it's interesting to look back at how this situations evolved. Um, in the late 18th century, in another discipline, I mean, Mozart actually died trying to break away from his patron. He wanted his freedom. He didn't want to operate in the style imposed on him by the Archbishop of Salzburg. And that led to the romantic artist. And somehow architects, I think, have taken on board the idea of the romantic artist and somehow it's got fused with the idea of following the Zeitgeist and the Zeitgeist at some point was perhaps a valuable thing it led to some very interesting buildings perhaps it led to the ideas of de Stiel for example who were trying to create a sort of metaphor for the future but one of the problems is that the Zeke beast, it seems to me, has become increasingly abstract. That uh, the forms, the metaphors created by de Stiel weren't exactly buildable. And it didn't take long for architects to find that following those forms produced quite a few problems, actually practical problems like water getting into the building and so on. And it seems to me that architecture arguably took a wrong turning at that point. And there was perhaps another model. There was another sort of metaphor which embraced, um, which embraced actually building, building technology and so on, which is that which was practiced throughout his life by Frank Lloyd Wright. If you look at Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings, they were always conceived in the materials that were buildable. They were practical problems, whether it was in the Roby house or whether it was in the Usonian houses. And that was part of a sort of arts and crafts tradition which concerned actually the putting together of buildings and generating forms which were buildable, also in some ways were metaphors for the spirit of the, of the times, but in fact suited the likes of normal people. They weren't buildings for an artistic minority. Um, and this accords in a way um, with my own experience of what architecture has to be about. And I know that if I'm going to design a good building, there's probably a number of things that have to be satisfied. Firstly, I have to identify with what the client actually wants. With his, with his, I have to understand what he wants. It doesn't matter whether he's designing a home for the mentally handicapped or whether he's a developer out to make profit. I've got to identify with those things and understand all the parameters that affect them. I've got to understand the technique that I need to build it 
I've got to understand the marketplace because I've got to understand how to procure it. And if I can do those things, there's a chance I can build a building which will, and if I do my job skillfully, might actually introduce some delight and pleasure into the equation as well. But it seems to me that unless we can do all those things in some way, we don't really stand a chance of succeeding in the marketplace. And we will end up, in a way, doing that 5% image making, for which we will be paid 5% of the fee, and 95% of the work which society actually needs will be done by somebody else. And I'm personally interested in an architecture which provides a service for the client, for the client, where I can act in a way independently and I'm not reliant on, on a patron who countenances, protects or gives me influential support. Uh, thank you, Peter. Peter, I, I'm not convinced, actually, I'm afraid. I, I, I think your, your position of the architect in that room, you know, with your, your powerful pencil being able to make a mark that sends the meeting in a certain direction. But when you're in that situation, you're already a caged tiger. You're caught. Uh, you're only allowed there in certain conditions. You're not autonomous. And you, I, I find it absolutely interesting, your, your uh, two parts of your, what you said. The idea that the architect is a professional man, there's some idea that there are professional values which transcend those of the client with the later part of your, your, your talk where you, where you said, uh, what about succeeding in the marketplace? You know, that doesn't quite ring true. There's an inconsistency there. And nor does the mention, if you don't mind me saying so, of Frank Lloyd Wright convince me. Uh, if you read an autobiography, uh, it is one client disaster after another. Uh, absolutely terrific. I mean, it's one of the most <coughs> shared books I've ever read. <laughs> uh, some of the run things worse than I do. The, the, um, the, 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 stra the strange thing is, Frank, that all those clients kept coming back. And well, they did they? Did they? Did they? And where was Frank Lloyd Wright in the context well, of the Well, there, 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 th there is just one yeah. point I, I wanted to, to make about that. It, it <coughs> seems to me that the, the idea of the artist, the, the architect as a builder, is epitomised in in the Frank Lloyd Wright, I think. The architect who, who actually is familiar with building technique, which I think is, is a, a sort of Anglo-Saxon model. And there is the other model, which is the certainly the French model, of the architect as the designer and all the technical stuff, which is done by minions in the Bureau de Tour to actually put the building up. Now, I think whatever um, the, the great buildings produced by... Anglo-Saxon architects, whatever they are, whether they're crafted buildings at a very traditional level, or whether they're buildings at a very high-tech level, tend in a way to be based on that sort of understanding of the building process. Andrew, would you like to on that? It's such a, it's it's such a rich topic, but it's hard to know where to begin. So hope to see tips of icebergs clearing out the green carpet. I know. Um, I think there's an interesting, there's some very interesting points in, in Bob Goodman's book, which you might have to, that you've already glanced at. With uh, you, you refer to the French tradition versus the arts and crafts tradition, and it's true in the States, uh, architects, even though that has received a buffeting, you know, when all the Germans arrived and, and, and shot immediately to the top of the academia. Um, there was a, a ripple in that, but it's such a powerful, uh, you know, people still revere the name of Paul Kreb and all the rest of them, and, and you know, it's a, it's a remarkable thing. And ironically, it's prepared American architects, I believe, better for the modern kind of teamwork to which Vincent alludes than does the arts and crafts tradition. Because if you look at where the arts and crafts tradition has led us, uh, particularly in British, in British practice, it's, it's led us, um, and don't let sight Paxton, that was well before, um, be he an inspiration for, for, for later comers. But, you know, we remember when, uh, when Americans flocked to England to see how we put up schools after the war. I mean, there was a, a high point of this constructive <coughs> attitude. But uh, very few people who would today be counted team members in, in the kind of team Vince is talking about were involved in that process. No, they were he heroic architects locked away in Hertfordshire who invented the whole thing from scratch. And it took a Duccio Turin at the Bartlett to show the world 
that it wasn't quite what it seemed. And then a degringolade as the, as the systems got worse and worse and started leaking or finally stopped dead. So I think that the, 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 one, the one point there is, is that this Beaux-Arts tradition, which we've, we've, we've much practice of, of sneering at here, um, has prepared these people somewhat better. And I think it's no accident that they therefore uh, fall into their roles, as it were, within these teams better. However, uh, Bob Goodman, um, as a central point in his book, fears that in their rush to please uh, the patrons, the new patrons, um, well, that's a label we'll stick on them for now, on that, what is a patron, in their rush to do that, that they may be losing the public trust. I think that's his great fear. And that uh, this happens because they uh, become too commercial in the way they present themselves to their clients and promote themselves. But um, again, I would say there's a good side to that. Uh, there are a lot of very good architects out there. I'm a client. How do I know who they are? I can't just flip through architecture magazines. That's not going to help me very much. There was a very important opening of American practice in the <coughs> early 70s um, with, the, uh, with, with, with a, an act of Congress which obliged public clients <coughs> to advertise all of their work uh, at uh, federal, state, uh, and local levels which opened the door to architects to go and find these clients and tell them why they should give them the job, which has re developed into a very refined process for shortlisting, short interviewing, selecting, and so on. So there is a formal uh, dialogue, or a scope for a formal dialogue, between an architect you don't know from a hole in the ground um, and you as, as, as the patron or client. And I think that's something which we will wait many, many, many decades to see ever in England, which is, uh, has been a different sort of patronage. It's been a patronage where, whereas in America, I think architects in public service, employed in public service, have never exceeded 6 or 7%. In England at a time, they were over 50%. Now, who were the patrons of those architects? Or of the private architects who went to those public bodies for commissions at the time. Remember when the LCC had 3,000 on its staff and those sort of things? Well, my goodness, they were also architects and they'd been to the same schools as the ones that, uh, who were applying for the jobs. And so there was a very closed sort of um, little scene. You win a, win a competition and be in work for the rest of your life. You never really had to go to the client and explain and move forward the case for uh, your ideas as opposed to somebody else's ideas would move things. So that it, it, it got a very hermetic culture of uh, this arts and crafts tradition within these public, essentially public driven bodies. And while public trust is the label, they would be eager to stick on uh, what they did. In reality, um, things quite often went adrift. And we did have buildings that leaked, buildings that people hated. Uh, and so on and so forth, which we went on and we loved them, and my goodness, the tiles could fall off, you know, and the, and the occupants could uh, rant and rave, but we gave them another medal and they went off to another country and built another building and still thought they were wonderful. These people who, under a different regime, might find it difficult to find a patron. Uh, what I'm saying is I think there's, the, there's a, a different, a, a long tradition of a, of a, of a, system of patronage in this country, which is reinforced by all sorts of cultural attitudes to patronage in a larger sense, uh, from princes downwards, little princes downwards, um, to what has occurred within a, a different democratic structure in the United States. And one of the reasons we have a major invasion of American practices here in England, I think at the moment, is because those clients, those patrons, whether they be for exterior architecture or interior architecture, are looking for a style of service uh, which the Americans have prepared themselves to give. I mean, their whole culture prepares them to give that. And so they find it easier to not feel affronted that a construction manager would uh, tell them how long it should take them to do something, or that uh, some arcane specialist in fire protection should tell them that uh, their core design doesn't work or whatever it should be. Um, I'll stop there. And, uh, go and Chen, I, I wondered if it was time to just mop up some differences of terminology. I mean, like a lot of other people, 
<coughs> I'd be happy to drop the word patriot in the rest of this. And if I understand that school of thought rightly, they would replace it by the word client. So that in your note, which somebody else referred to, I'm just looking at one or two of your questions, mm -hmm. and I'm replacing the word patron with the word client. It sounds better, doesn't it? Um, and we've had a perfectly respectable definition of the client's number one thing, and that is to protect his investment in the land, which I don't quarrel. Having said all that, I mean, just like architects or butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, there are good clients, there are bad clients, and there are mediocre clients. And it seems to me the whole issue, whether we call them clients or patrons or architects or whatever you want to call them, the issue is to develop some technique of getting good clients to use good architects and to make life more and more difficult for bad clients who will persist in using bloody awful architects. <laughs> and therefore, what I hope is common to both client and architect is, and everybody in this room, is to strive to do something, God help us, to stop this horrible slide of architectural mediocrity. I'm not talking about stars. I'm just talking about excellence, or whatever word you want to put in its place. I'm interested in what Andrew was saying about the American system of spotting talent. And I think this is another aspect of the problem here. I mean, it's not going to be too long before all the Fosters and Rogers and Sterlings and you name them have, have run out or they've gone or they've retired or something. Somewhere below that level, there has to be a mass of young architects and we must find a way, rather as he was suggesting as an American example, of keeping tabs on these guys and collectively doing something about making sure that they get their chances early enough from good clients and don't get ravaged and seduced and ruined by being exposed to bad clients. So the corrupting influence of the client is something we <laughs> 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 protect ourselves in. Alan, you know about corrupt clients uh, since you uh, are <coughs> yes. positioned in the RBA. I'm Alan Meekle. I'm... Uh, was an architect, I suppose I still am, but I've also been a client and I'm currently a marriage broker. So I see both sides of this issue. If I can just come back, Andrew, because of course I was in the position that you mentioned of being one of those people who were in the 50% who worked for the public clients. At that time, I don't think we had any doubt. We thought that we were designing for the people who were going to use the buildings. We had an elusive search to find out who they were, and that's a big issue, who is the real client. But there was no doubt in our mind that that is what we were trying to do. The fact that the technology went a bit wrong was common to most architects working at that time, and I don't think you could lay that at our door in particular. We're not the only people who designed flat roofs. Um, as to your second point, the one that Gordon touches on, how do you get excellence? When I listen to my telephone, I have a simple task. I try to understand what it is the client expects from his architect. And I try to think of an architect who can satisfy it, so that the happy marriage will produce an offspring which is good and excellent architecture. And I think that's not too high an ambition. We all expect that marriage will produce a good offspring. We often wonder why some people marry marry the partners that they do. But it's surprising, in fact, how many successful marriages can take place. And I never cease to wonder that, in fact, there are a lot of good connections between architects and clients. But if we could find a vehicle for making that more commonplace, so that those disaffected architects who are wandering around trying to find the clients will give them the commission, and those clients who are trying to find that talent which is undoubtedly there, if we had a better mechanism for bringing those two people together, I think we would get the excellent architecture that you want. I'm rather interested to know where the results of all these happy marriages are to be found. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't, uh, I mean, I could name a lot of individual buildings, but it would take a long time. I mean, I think if you, if you look through the, uh, the annual awards, you underlying many of those are very successful combinations. Um, Were the marriages for it? Perhaps there are ideas. I take part in a, a very interesting uh, award which is run by the National Times, which is uh, called the Design Management Award, which is not about the object design, but about the process by which the object 
design is made and how that relates to the objects of the organization that uh, is following that. I must say that, that, that view, that perspective, results in very strange, very different sorts of decisions than one would normally expect if one were using a, a kind of a port and place based uh, criteria. Andrew, oh. as a client. As a client. I was just thinking that uh, sitting here with Vincent here, listening to what he said, there may be some things we should have picked out of him and just hammered a bit more because we're actually trying to find the mechanism for arriving at quality of architecture, not talking about style and all the other things. I think we're, we're missing one key element that's been half mentioned in this, this marriage business. And marriage has intensely got to be worked at by both parties. And I think one of the great errors that's happened is that the marriage has been very much one of convenience where the parties get married and then go off and do their own thing. Now, learning at, uh, yeah. and I must say this honestly in public, uh, from, from Vincent and his team and his company working with them over many years, they really mean what they say when they say that a good architecture is good business. Now, this is fairly unusual from speculative developers. Now, the speculative developer myself, I must say they're going to be an endangered species very soon. But <coughs> right now, it's a very small segment of the market, but I think there's more effort being put into some of the new merchant developers into actually seeking for good architecture than there is in any other form of the business. And this is illustrated by the fact that good architecture is good business. And what I've discovered, looking at bad and good marriages, is something nobody's bothered to mention tonight is that the relationship between the client, or the patron, whatever word you wish to use, and the architect <coughs> must be one, one-on-one, -on -one, somebody has said, but it must be one of mutual challenge. Unless they're challenging one another, and I've seen uh, Vincent's uh, a great partner in the sky, Uncle Stuart, go in, and it didn't really matter what the architect has produced, he just said, this is terrific stuff, but it's not good enough. Go back again. How often in the clients recently, both public and private, have accepted it looks quite nice on paper and not challenged every single aspect? And what Stuart used and other people use in our game at the moment, the only thing they can challenge them with, if they aren't architectural people who understand architecture and architects speak, is in fact to go back to a brief and how many architects are not working with a clear brief. And that brief must be based on what you're trying to do the building for the consumer. Now, what actually happened in the, in the Broadgate, very, very often forgotten, not by, uh, by Frank, who's still banking fees, but the amount of research that went into what the consumer wanted, agonizing over the consumer, meeting consumers by the hundreds at consumer breakfasts, going through exactly what they wanted, what they wanted to look for, what their staff wanted, wanted how they were going to relate to their buildings, the flexibility they were talking about, and from that emerged the brief that the developer and the architect were able to challenge each other to resolve as many problems as possible within the context of good architecture. And in this, that relationship, that challenge is going on between the architect and the client on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you will never get good architecture. Yeah, this is a thing I'm um, While we're on a sort of practical note, um, I'd really like to go perhaps a little further back still. <coughs> Um, we seem to be skating around the point that buildings are in fact very important to clients. They are some of the biggest spend, apart from people who are in the game of developing buildings all the time. Individual clients uh, probably have as big a spend on building the first time of, uh, in their whole lifetime. Um, we haven't really, I think, addressed ourselves as to who is the real client. In my experience, He's really the man who signs the checks. He, he is actually the boss of the organization. And we tend to, a lot of buildings go wrong because we haven't got the right relationship um, with the client. Now, buildings are very important. If a building's brief is to be properly researched, even by the architect, you have to probe very deeply into the nature of the organization that you're dealing with. And that inevitably involves you dealing with the boss. And the jobs, in my experience, have gone wrong of where, where the boss, as it were, has not been accessible. Neither has he delegated properly to somebody who has authority to make decisions in his name. Um, so, crudely, the client has to be, I think, important as an architect to get at the 
uh, the person who signs the checks or is the person with the authority to do that. Now, to be a good client is actually very hard work, in my experience. Um, uh, good buildings come not from architects alone, but from an equal input by the architect and the client, let alone the builder himself. And you have, as been, has been said, um, to put a great deal of effort in making clear what the client actually requires of the building. Now, who is the architect? Um, he is, in fact, again, I think, an individual. Good buildings are made between individuals ultimately. They're not made between organizations. And that, I think, is a mistake in the present time, where you throw two organizations together and expect somehow out of this rather ill-defined structure of each uh, something great to come out of it. The, the architect leader is, the per is an individual person with a name who meets a, a client with a name. He's in fact uh, the leader of a team. He's the animateur, the director of all, all the facets that, that he deals with. Now, I think however big the building, however big the team on each side, you still have to have that relationship uh, of individuals um, to get a good building. Now, who, um, there are very few clients who are patrons, uh, as Gordon Graham said, there, there are very much clients, there are very few patrons who wish to um, give an architect a chance to continue what he's already doing, developing a style. Most clients, I think, want a building, their problems answering. And I think architects have had it too much their own way, where they have been, in fact, the initiators. They have almost ignored the client. And if you don't listen hard to the client's requirements and think deeply about the practicalities of building in those particular circumstances on that particular site, with that particular contractor, and all the rest of it, you're going to be in trouble. So I do think this fundamental relationship is absolutely crucial. Thank you. That's. Uh um, Margaret Thatcher apparently has banned the use of the word society uh, in her conversation. There's no such thing, concept as society. It's all individuals. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to make a small point, and it's perhaps a little trivial. And that is that, sir, uh, if you ran a restaurant, you would actually expect your patrons to like food. And I think that, sir, uh, it's actually rather important to think that architectural patrons actually enjoy architecture in the way that restaurant patrons enjoy food. And really, I, I have to say, Frank, that's it. Right. Um, well, after you think I was talking, I was reminded of, of two marriages um, which typified some of the fundamentals Keith was talking about, which certainly included continual challenge by architect and uh, client, if not patron. One was Lloyd's with Richard Rogers, and the other was the Bank of Hong Kong with Norman Foster, um, both of which I was privileged to, to follow during that incredible course of those two vast organizations, but headed by striking individuals and two equally striking architects who would not make a move without their right to consult the top individuals in those organizations. Those clients, to my own personal knowledge, enjoyed the whole experience, uh, just like your restaurateur being interested in food. They loved the whole experience. I think both architects did. And bingo, you know, I don't care whether you like them or not, you've got two incredible buildings. I was simply going to suggest, Roger Colton, that we may have adopted an inappropriate model to relate the architect and the client. I think it's less a situation of marriage than uh, perhaps it is in a nacho toi. I think the, the missing uh, participant in the relationship uh, is the planning organization, which has a much greater influence, in my experience, in Britain, uh, than is the case um, in the United States. I think the degree to which the architect is 
often compromised by the planning authorities and the degree to which the client is frustrated in his objectives by the planning authorities is very considerable. I think the architect is probably at a greater disadvantage than the client. The client maintains his integrity. He is the agent of the project. And what concerns me particularly is the prospect that the architect becomes a filter between the client and the planner, that the dialogue is not, as we suggested at the outset, between the uh, client patron and the designer, the traditional relationship, which has produced very often great pieces of architecture, as well as some which are not. But, but isn't the, isn't the kind, of, kind of, just a comedy way of talking about the people? I mean, uh, that's you know, that the wonderful phrase in Corridan is, what is the city but the people? <coughs> the people have a uh, right to have a say in how it's achieved democratically or whatever mm -hmm. process it's achieved in, in the shaping of the cities. Perhaps in theory this is the case. I'm, I'm unconvinced in practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm sure it's Absolutely. It's a thank what you just said. extremely interesting because um, the, uh, the third component um, which you call planning uh, might, might have been called, might still yet be called public taste. And it also might be called um, civic responsibility. It also might be called urban design. It also might be called the capacity of society to have visions of the future of its cities. Um, I think one of the problems we all have um, is that um, we work in a kind of uh, chaotic cultural void in which the planets are very decisive because there's, they have the culture of cities um, has simply hasn't sort of kept up with what's going on. Maybe it never can. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the thing's out of control. Um, but there's a very, very strong sense around at the moment that that needs to be remedied and that the planning process, I just written a piece actually for the AJ on this, might move into a completely new form, um, um, which is much to, to, more to do with the quality of the environment. This <coughs> is to do with quantitative aspects of it, <coughs> in which case we're entirely different position. Uh, Nita first. Well, I'm a little bit concerned that actually that the discussion seems uh, to be somehow reductive, that uh, within the two thirds, uh, uh, patron and client uh, becoming uh, somehow identical. Because I think that there is a, a, a difference between the two thirds. Uh, and in that difference uh, has to do with the word vision and the word public realm that somehow were introduced now. A uh, patron is uh, somebody who is uh, interested not only in the good of his organization and in the perfect fit of the marriage between uh, the architect and uh, the client within the organizational realm that uh, he uh, is invested with other money or power or whatever, but he's also interested in what uh, he's doing uh, um, for uh, society at large. I know that we should use the word, but the word does exist, because the word is also that the thing that they, you know, comprises the uh, green and pavement and uh, stones and fountains and that sort of thing. It seems to me that the one before was actually introducing that concept when actually was saying we are not just uh, interested in building uh, an office building uh, which is good for itself, but, but an office building you know, is uh, like no man is an island, it doesn't exist by itself <coughs> in the city. It exists in an environment, it consumes energy, it has a, a lot to do for uh, general organization of life, it could be inverted comma a green building or it could not be a green building and there could be you know, a, a positive example for certain policies and uh, it could be a progressive cultural statement or it could be a retrogressive cultural statement independently if the fit of the marriage is a good fit or a bad fit. Now, that progressive or retrogressive uh, cultural statement has a lot to do with the vision of the patron. And the vision of the patron that can select a good architect, not only because he's a competent architect, steeped in the arts and craft way of doing a good building, but also because he's a person with a vision to match his own. Well, I buy this idea of weddings. I actually get the idea that we're talking about either a small chapel or 
the equivalent of a Mooney wedding with thousands of couples from different organizations <laughs> somehow getting together. I think this is what Frank was in, intimating at the like beginning. To the moon, yes, I think so. <laughs> so yes. But you, you seem to sympathize more with the idea that you mesh together great kind of masses of individuals who are represented, however, kind of a, strangely in organizations. And I, I thought you were beginning to say that only in a building which is stylistically and functionally almost opaque and invisible can be expected to meet the needs of uh, these uh, complex organizations constantly moving in and around these uh, structures. But uh, I think there's uh, an alternative to the notion of organization just purely as a sort of systems uh, problem, and that is that co 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 companies and organizations have a cultural um, identity and a cultural uh, nature as well. I think that the role of patronage today is not so much in terms of making broad statements about society, but in terms of trying to direct organizations um, in one direction or another. That uh, I mean, the Japanese are actually fanatical about this. As you know, they want to uh, project their, themselves into an image of, a, of an information-based economy 10 years from now. And they very consciously see architecture and building as one way of doing that, of molding their organization and their culture. And I think this may be one of the periods where it's an interregnum now where nobody's actually come up with a language to describe informatically driven organizations. But because we haven't got the language yet, it doesn't mean to say that we will not develop one. And that will be uh, seen as very powerful by patrons as well as by architects. I, I, I agree, actually. I think the, the, the ideas that I'm, about, I, I'm, not, I'm not in, I don't believe in a uh, transparent, uh, transparent buildings. So the, the, the building actually inevitably uh, picks up uh, and broadcasts the, the values of the culture in which it, it surrounds. And as, as Mika pointed out, it's not, uh, it's not a, a politically neutral act to choose an architect. It's, uh, it's a full, of, uh, a full of values, that choice. And that's uh, uh, that make, what makes it so charged, so difficult. And it's not simply a proud choice. It's uh, something about the, the shape of society. That, uh, that's what makes it so critical and so, so difficult to do. Right. So, I, 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 Roy Lando, I'd quite like to join the back to the patron club as well. Um, <coughs> simply because I think the patron does express something of a different level from the client. Client is just a sort of exchange. Patron is actually talking about the arts. And in fact, uh, what I sort of dislike to sort of stress a little bit. Uh, is, and it can join up with this, is the notion of architectural responsibility towards architecture, which is also a joint responsibility with the patron. Now, I think we've sort of been listening a bit to discussions about, you know, how to get a client and so on, uh, and how this is a sort of necessary act for survival or for success or whatever. But I think we've also got to acknowledge that architecture is also about other things. It's also about developing and meeting the problems and thinking about the city. It's about thinking about, about form. It's about thinking about technology. And these are both patronage problems and architect problems, although the architect is going to be ultimately somebody who is going to be obsessed with them. I mean, this is going to be his, his sort of full-time uh, day and night worry, what to do next. And, and I hate to think that, that sort of the architect only thinks about, about the next job or the big job. I would like to sort of argue that in the history of architecture, some of the most important breakthrough notions have been the little jobs, some of the first jobs, some of the things that people do right from the start, maybe they're their own patron, in which case they're playing several roles. But I do just want to sort of put on the agenda, uh, at just the beginnings of a discussion, that the architecture has got somewhere to go. It's got problems to solve. It has a great complex world of problems that it is trying to solve, that it's very unhappy about and that they are joint patron and architecture problems. Sometimes the patron might not be able to make a quick buck out of them, but at other times he might. But of course they are still problems to be solved, and they might have to be solved at the minutest level. And I do think that, that somehow this uh, focus, if I may put it that way, this focus on the architectural discourse, which is not just 
the main thing that the architect is concerned with, but it's the activity of the making of architecture which we are all concerned with at many different levels. I think that's got to be brought back into the conversation. Yes, I, I, uh, I started the conversation unexpectedly at Frank's request with some simplistic remarks about the needs for architects to understand. I'm sorry, we can't hear. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I made some simple remarks to begin with about the need for architects to understand the financial strictures and structure which the client was operating on. And the company that I work in, that is very significant, and I think it really directly defines patronage, if you like, because if we are successful with what we build, we can keep our building program rolling, as it were. Uh, and that is actually an infinite uh, vision of it, um, as each project is, is uh, <coughs> completed, it's probably dealing with a 25-year time scale of expectation or whatever, and so you can imagine that those ones which we completed 19 years ago or whatever are nearing the end of that life and so on and so forth, and if those are good buildings, whatever that is, you have patronage and you have a successful system in which you're operating and you have a vibrant marketplace and city and so on. But I think the rest of this conversation actually, at certain points, is very largely misplaced in the attribution of importance to architects or to the architect, as it were, it seems to me that many of the problems that we want solved, I have to refer to Broadgate again, do not require much other than an understanding of those issues that have been touched upon. What it is the building is for, and many of the buildings that we're concerned with are rather ubiquitous buildings that inherit flexibility and various things for obvious office functions and so on, which are hard to find in the absence of clients. And it seems to me that that sort of building is something that we're all concerned with. And that if you are promoting those buildings, one of the problems that you're constantly up against is getting the architect to deal with the problem and promote the building or the brief, as it were, and solve the issues that you want dealt with. And certainly dealing with leading architects, it would seem that somehow between that process of getting this successful thing, this bit of infill to society, wherever it is, you're dealing with some problem of their personality rather than the problem of the building. And I would make a plea that uh, much architecture is unnecessary, really, in the sense that it is often talked about here, in the sense that um, continuous sex is meaningless, really. It couldn't be enjoyed. And I think buildings are a bit like that. There's only a few of them that require this architectural overload. And I think the profession finds that quite hard to understand. And again, I think Broadgate assembled spaces very successfully with fairly um, repetitive systems, as it were, that perhaps you couldn't really identify the architect from one building to the next. But it is an architect, it is the same architect. And it seems that the subjugation of that particular personality, which is a very powerful personality, happens, is not necessarily reflected in the total product. And I, I think that's what patronage is about. Patronage enables things to happen in a long term scale. But so it's also. I, yeah, Cedric. Cedric? Yeah. I'm going to take a long time. <laughs> 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 well, I'll leave it. Jasper uh, I'll make a short point. <laughs> but I wanted to take the opportunity to um, lay a sort of a strength of emphasis upon the slightly altruistic um, intonation of patron. In other words, when one asks uh, a developer, are you also a patron of architecture? One's asking that the singular person or the corporate body responsible for enacting a building is taking on a weightier responsibility than merely the broader confines of 
what if it is making money or satisfying the greed? In other words, one is actually trying to, like the, the girl over there said, evoke a responsibility of vision which is pertinent, certainly to the present. And going back to one of Ronald's earlier remarks, which I may not have understood it well, but I would like to sort of reconjure it. When you talk about a building, if I may say, being responsive to the building next door so that it makes possible um, an art, a building that occurs to it later at another time or next door to it. In other words, the, introducing this notion of responsibility not only as an architect, not only as a, a commercial developer, not only as the, the patron, but quite honestly awakening to the context that society undoubtedly finds itself in at the moment. And that is one of, to some extent, planetary crisis. You know, of materials, of energy consumption, of you know, um, toxic outputs, and taking on a vision which is broader, which isn't frightened of acknowledging that we live in a, a planet which is in thermal crisis, and awakening, as a patron or as an architect, um, a development of building and thinking about buildings that is responsible. Andrew, I'm sorry. Andrew, did that make sense to you? That, that you what? Yes. To me? Yes. That made sense. And the speaker before, Cedric Price, sorry, an architect. Um, I think what has, has come out of the last few contributions, particularly your own, is, is what has been missing earlier on, and that is introducing an element of time, the recognition of which is of varying responsibility whether to client, patron, or architect. And I take up the points made about patronage. Um, I, I think it is mistitled uh, uh, this evening's talk. Um, and as everyone's been thumbing through dictionaries, so have I. <laughs> <laughs> um, and because it's always laughed at, because I use the very large multi-volume Oxford Dictionary, which I'll quote at the end of these. I'll use the little short Chambers Dictionary. Patronage is kindness done in a condescending way. <laughs> uh, patronage is the support given or custom brought by a patron. Uh, client is a person depending on other, others for patronage. Client. And the favorite one, mine, is client who's someone who comes to in a state of distress. <laughs> <laughs> now, the point about this is time. That's all. It's not being, you know, Lord Snooty or anything about that. It's the point Andrew Rabinet made earlier on in the relationship between American architects and English architects. It's the point that you, Gordon Graham, made also that there is a disproportion, there's a difference in the time, and it's what you made, referred to, I heard earlier on, as the lady, was it? I made that, I like that. <laughs> Quite right, too. It's the point of time. It's the point of how much time a particular task is required by whether they be, and I would have thought we're talking about clients tonight, not about patients. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I, I must say, I've never had a patron. <laughs> they, they, they've always tried anyone, everyone else before they came to me, and they were in a state of distress. <laughs> <laughs> they were broke late or tried to find a, a quick corner. And what has been very interesting this evening, up till now, but it's only a, it's only a moment in time, as has been referred to by our, our chairman, Frank, earlier in the evening, um, that it's been very interesting, the, the public patronage, so someone gave a, a percentage, you know, 10 years ago, or this particular thing, or that, but the, there has been very little reference to public patronage, which when you come on to defense spending, or prisons and things, is an awfully high proportion of a lot of architecture built. But there's been no mention of that tonight. Not that I say there should be. But there has been, as far as I'm concerned, uh, primarily a concern with clients who, for one reason or another, as you've pointed out, can afford not to make a mistake 
but to develop through what they're doing to something else. But the responsibility of the architect is, is the enablement of, of saying, you know, hold, hold on, you don't need me. You know, try, because all, all this business about, what was the, the Broadgate, you quote, you see, Broadgate, superb well service anonymity. Don't know who your clients will be, lasting and things. It's worth bearing in mind, when you were talking about 20 or 25 years, it's worth bearing in mind that the development age of, of, of take the, the, the clumsiest bit of, of what we call defense machinery, the tank, something we really think is all to do with mud and thick steel. The development of the computer systems for a new tank system from the design, from the programming, from the client and the architect chatting about such control to testing, failure, costing, rethink, building the tank, testing it, selling the tank, getting it on the road, etc., etc., before you start scrapping it or selling it to the Middle East, is 25 years. The gap between the two world wars was 21 years. Now, when, it's, when we're actually involving a great deal of design, a great deal of public patronage and private patronage, albeit, in programs that are talking about 20 and 25 years time, then I agree with you, the individual building may not be all that important, but if the individual building isn't all that important, if it, if it can change its face, if it can be well-serviced anonymity, if uh, Mr. What was his name? Bedstead, who started the, the Canary Walk thing. Um, I remember him telling me we need, we need uh, a meter, a meter uh, for computer floors, meter deep. And he was rather proud about how many, how much space fiber optics took up in that floor. You know, check that out now. And 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 floor level says Ravenet will know. Um, so even then, all that animation, <coughs> what then becomes very particular is why do it over the top of a 19th century railway terminal? <laughs> so location becomes very questionable as, as far as, as, as the building becomes more anonymous. Now we know that the banking system in Hong Kong is in fact an electrified system of high stool and pen pushing. And the, the, the whole nature of process. So it's quite likely that buildings that we accept as very modern at the moment are more likely to live longer in 19th century servicing situations of communication, energy, exchange, and trust, for instance, banking, in places like Hong Kong than they are over a 19th century railway station in a town which our chairman said. Uh, we should throw, no, can we, yes, throw, throw up the architecture that ought to be appropriate for greater cities like this in turbulent times. Well, that, is, that isn't much of a marriage contract, is it? <laughs> I mean, all this <laughs> Good So I, I do think that the, the interesting thing about tonight has come out in the, in the last five contributions that it may be that architecture, in, in taking out, for instance, uh, Dr. Landau's point about um, uh, enablement, that it may be that architects uh, have, in fact, to hold back from being all that intensely useful to, to clients in distress, unless they can say, now look, up till now, I can, you know, on that sort of cycle, on that sort of museum modern art calendar with picture every other page, I can probably carry you through on that way. But just listen to me about, about, you know, not being too certain that 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 certain situation which uh, Hubert used to put his slave labour in 
uh, while he was building Regent's Park, but we all know it's an Oxbow Lake, which smokes, floods, and it's a pretty evil place to live anyhow. What do we call it? We call it Docklands, I'm sorry. Yeah. We, we only call it Docklands because there are no docks, no trains, and no dockers there. But that's English, isn't it? It's like heritage. What's that mean? <laughs> it means you want to get rid of it. Um, um, I, I think that the, the, the serious conversation is that it was getting somewhere near this whole business of the usefulness of, of architects to all sorts of clients. Doesn't matter whether they're public, private, whether, uh, as, as Fibbin pointed out, and he's gone. No, he's not. He's no, gone. he's still here. Uh, he pointed out, doesn't matter big or small, it's this introduction and the appropriate design capacity. All right, you have to build all this business about, I, I particularly love this business about roofs that don't leak. I happened to occupy an office that was intensely rebuilt about a year ago because some clown under Edward Montague had listed it. And it's all in heavy lead and say it was the first one to go a week last Thursday. <laughs> and we lost that ceiling in the top floor. So I think mean, that but it, it would have photographed very well in some RIBA award, usually for the provinces. Norwich. <laughs> 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 trying to make an even sandwich. It's more uh, different science, it doesn't matter whether it's public or private, different science saying, one, we want to enable as from tomorrow, two, we want to neutralize as any cycle or time age that might be valid to what we're putting in there, which if we make more and more flexible, then the sighting becomes more and more of limit, as does the business of whether you work in an office block or, or do your funny things at home. But I'm certain that the husband who is, gets bored of the wife who is, who is doing all the work at home on her computer and making television, and he's making soup or looking after the killer dog. Um, <laughs> says, you know, I, I really wish you'd go out to the office again. I really wish, you know, can't you, or can't you have that, that you know, telex or something in your car and take it down the other end of the, of the garden, which we, you know, in a way, sold our children's livelihood for. Um, you know, private school, I um, <laughs> Now, this is the important thing, and this is where continuously architects the earlier points made about actually what architects can provide should be listened to by clients who are someone who come to you in a state of distress. Because as far as I'm concerned, clients have tried other things, like packaged soup, you know, <laughs> share, you know, there are lots of things that architects think, oh, my word, they need a building. Don't you be fooled. Building may, may be quite low down on their shopping list. So we shouldn't be too grand about the position we hold. And that's why I didn't like the word Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cedric, I think there is a, a dangerous underlying issue that this conversation has consistently skirted around. And it was something to do with the idea of anonymity or politeness, architectural manners. Um, Andrew also mentioned that in terms of the client expectation, if you, like, if you wish to call me a client, in the ability of the Americans to invade this market as architectural designers under their sort of uh, KPF or SOM uh, identities and so on. And I think it's something that should be taken very seriously, as has that issue of architectural excellence which was raised where two buildings were coated as being examples of British ingenuity or whatever it is, architectural skill, which have almost without exception until recently led to no significant commissions or further commissions in this country to those particular architects. And I think that there would be a reason for this that might be uh, some other discussion may be. Uh, uh, there are reasons that would explain why the uh, 
the architects for buildings like um, Lloyd's and Hong Kong Shanghai Bank have not necessarily found a client base that you might have expected them to, whereas others who for a long time were relatively unknown until quite recently seem to be in a position to produce a product, an architectural product as it were, that developers, clients, patrons call it, whatever you will, all of a sudden found very acceptable. And it's interesting that they were not the luminaries of the, of the um, high design, as it were, in this country. And there has to be a lesson in that, I think. And I think that the lesson hasn't gone far enough or deep enough myself. What lesson would you draw from it? Um, the, the, the lesson is, is one that is, I think, um, a dangerous one to discuss in, in simple terms. I, I think the indication would be that people have traditionally <coughs> not gone to that source for their buildings because of uh, uh, legitimate or, or, or other rumors to do with the costs that they might have to meet to get that image or or, um, or whatever. It, and that was the point that I was touching on that I think we see buildings as clients as, as being able to be defined as a set of problems and not something which provides um, the wherewithal for someone to express themselves, shall we say. And it's that gap that has to be closed. And I think that's a traditional view of architects very often, that what you're doing is you're allowing them to express themselves. I, I'm, it's a very gross simplification, actually, but I think you understand what I mean. I think, yeah, you know, it's interesting, long. because if you, take, if you take the growth of the, uh, well, the camera, but particularly the Polaroid camera, um, and, and the whole business about portrait painting, particularly someone like Constable, who didn't like painting people's portraits, not loved painting the background, but he got portraits. Primarily, if you think of, of painting portraits for rich people, uh, you've got named painters who painted them, but the other people found people who could turn them out quickly. This was before the camera, and, and uh, it didn't matter as long as the house in the background looked all right. So there's that business about um, that wasn't quite what we wanted, as long as it's established we use a photographer, i.e., as long as it's established that we use an architect, that, that's one level. But the other one is, is, is the process and time one, which interests me more, that at, at any one time, uh, rather like if you take Philip Johnson's a, at and the Chippendale thing. Now, uh, it, it's interesting that, that uh, that was when, and I, I can't really draw, I, I mean, I would do it if Richard was here, and, and, and what's his name, the, the client of Lloyd's, but I, I got suspicion. But certainly AT&T was in a sh pretty shaky time because of the opening up of all sorts of other uh, companies that could run telephone systems. When they built that headquarters, and, and I, I, why I said about Richard, I was thinking about Lloyd's, the shaky time. What I'm interested in is that now and again, architecture is used as, as, um, as the sort of ranch house and stone fireplace used to be by the husband, you know, saying to his wife, don't worry, you know, we're firm, the family is together, and this, this is the house on which I built, and you can see it, this is a good family good generation. Whereas it's the little insurance uh, death policy in the drawer that the wife keeps in case the husband turns the toes up now. But do you know what I mean? That very often institutions which aren't quite sure, and this applies to public institutions, government just as much as private, there's no particular exception. When they're a little bit shaky, they tend to put on, put on the show. Uh, think, think of that great program for, well, I don't know if you know it, but an enormous program for redesigning post offices. Just about the time that a lot of the services done by the post office were able to be taken out of their hands and put into private hands. Just the same with telephones, possibly the same with stock exchange. So perhaps, never mind patronage, it may be the business of, of you know, you don't get someone to you don't get someone to design the big M for McDonald's. You get someone to design a very good corporate center or an enormous sort of evidence 
of, of just how well rooted you are. And again, it's nothing to do with just private, public as well. So architecture may be used as, as one of those, um, uh, you, you know, the, the difference between a flag that you took, you stood in the ground, it flew, and you took it with you as you moved, and the flagpole on buildings. Okay. They're very suspicious. New companies that put up flagpoles and have a corporate flag, watch them. <laughs> but I mean, I, I absolutely agree with what you said. Yes. Should well, be addressed. I think we should begin to draw the, the discussion to a close now. Uh, well, uh, well, we need your perspective. Um, well, I don't know how useful it is. I remember when I, when I first came to London almost 40 years ago as a student. And I, I had a letter of introduction to the then editor of the Economist magazine. And I remember going to see him. And, and as a young 20-year-old, I, uh, I uh, uh, pontificated even more than I do now. And uh, I remember during the, at the end of the conversation, he said to me, you know, it's quite all right for us to talk like this uh, uh, informally and when you're in private. But if you ever appear in public during the uh, course of your year here and you're asked a question about your view of this or that issue in England, always remember to answer in the following way. Uh, as a visitor, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't really feel that way this evening because it does seem to me that uh, uh, what's being discussed here uh, this evening is so similar to the kinds of issues that uh, I've encountered in the last uh, several years. But, but, but uh, in the U.S., and um, um, I, I couldn't help, though, as I, as I uh, was sitting here in the last few minutes, uh, recalling that the independent uh, sh group show is now on at the ICA, and I've been asking myself, how, how, how would this discourse differ if um, it were that time, back in um, uh, the 50s, um, and um, if that group of people were faced with um, these, these kinds of issues. And I think the discourse would be very different, because um, uh, as several people have already suggested, uh, what, what we're really, I think, facing now uh, in architecture in both our countries is the question of who is to take care of architecture? Um, who, who, is, who is to assume responsibility? Or how do we assign responsibility for the um, quality of the building uh, and uh, the urban environments that um, are uh, being, being produced. Now that generation, uh, represented by the independents and in Team 10, had, as uh, several people have already suggested, a uh, very easy answer to that. I mean, that uh, the public sector would take that responsibility. We, we could count on, or you could count on, on the Labor Party, or some, we could count on the um, post-war Democratic Party in power. Uh, and uh, certainly in the English case, uh, this matter would be dealt with adequately by, uh, by having architects in public employment and in charge, in effect, of, of the building programs. But um, as we all know very well, that um, turned out to be a very disillusioning experience. And, uh, uh, and there was this um, great revulsion against the architecture that was produced uh, by your version of the welfare state as well as by our version of the welfare state. <coughs> and it, it was that revulsion that laid the basis, uh, at least in the U.S., for uh, uh, postmodernism. I, I always date it to uh, uh, Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction of 1966, in which Venturi, in effect, rejects so many of those ideas associated with Orthodox modernism, and says that he wants to uh, turn attention to architecture itself, uh, and uh, says that uh, uh, 
uh, he wants to narrow the scope of architectural concerns, and he says, ironically, although I think he really meant paradoxically, he said, ironically, uh, power and influence will take care of themselves. I mean, he, he really did think, as uh, certainly American architects have generally thought for the last 20 or 25 years, that that just by concentrating on the task of architecture in its more classical or traditional sense, uh, <coughs> these problems would take care of themselves. That just, uh, somehow or other, the quality of building would um, be upgraded and, and uh, the cities would improve. But of course, as we've learned, these things don't take care of themselves. Somebody always uh, has a hand in deciding what happens? Uh, and um, as we've discovered, I think, and as this conversation and the anguish represented by this conversation reveals, uh, very often uh, 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 these things end up in the hands of the wrong people, or at least of people who, um, who aren't really in a position uh, to address more general concerns of um, the quality of, of life, either within buildings or outside of buildings. And, and, I, and I think that's really, as I see it, what we're all searching for in this discussion of patronage and patronage versus clientage and are there really patrons anymore and uh, uh, how do we organize the design process and how should architects relate the patrons. I mean, th there is this, this deep concern, I think, throughout, uh, in both our countries, and I don't know the continent well enough to be able to answer the question of whether it also is true in, 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 in Western Europe, but, but there is this deep concern about, about um, how do we, how, who, who takes care of architecture? Who, who will assume responsibility for the for the uh, quality of the environment. I, I agree with those who say there is a difference between a patron and a client. I mean, patronage at its best uh, is like uh, the person who uh, chooses a good restaurant, you know. I mean, you, you, you expect, you expect uh, that, um, uh, you expect, uh, uh, in order for a client to be a patron, he, he has to, or she has to be someone who cares about architecture and cares about the quality of building and is in a position to care. I, th I think one of, one of the things that we're discovering, as many of the clients represented here have, have, have made clear, they're often not in a position to, to really uh, care about the quality of architecture, that the pressures uh, that are exerted in, in, in the building process, in, in the role of a client, are such that often uh, architectural values have to be sacrificed. Not always, but most of the time. And as we've already also discovered, there are lots of architects out there who are willing to make that sacrifice of architecture. I think this is, this is part of the problem that the, the profession has expanded so much uh, and architects are much more widely used than they ever were before more buildings are architect design, and this is revealed, as it were, the soft underbelly of the profession, that many of the professionals themselves are not taking care for architecture. The situation is, is very analogous, it seems to me, to what happens, at least in our own country, in the medical profession and, and in, in the legal system. You can say, who's taking care of the public health? Right. And often you find out it's the physicians who are least likely to be taking care of the public health. It's the lawyers who are least likely, or some lawyers, to be concerned with the preservation of justice. And this isn't to indict the professional or to <coughs> indict the client. I, I, I think there's a, there's a genuine dilemma here, a genuine problem here. We are searching, all of us, in our own way, as developers, as clients, as professionals, as critics, as planners, as public officials, we're all searching for a way of um, manifesting in practical terms our uh, basic 
impulse to uh, upgrade the quality of the cities and the buildings for which we have responsibility. And it seems what we've been saying tonight is, is that uh, much to our regret, we're often in a position where uh, we, we don't know how to do that. Uh, and it's become more complicated in all kinds of ways, not only are are there more architect design buildings, and that reveals the soft underbelly of the profession. Not only uh, is, uh, it, uh, are more buildings produced for uh, obviously commercial purposes, it would be interesting to have an institutional client here and see how, whether, whether we would uh, react in the same way with it. The building process has become much more complicated, the projects are more difficult, it's harder for uh, uh, an architect to exert control, uh, the idea of the individual architect or solo practitioner certainly is, is disappearing. I mean, most practitioners in the 19th and much of the 20th century were solo practitioners, and even though uh, uh, about half of uh, AIA and RIBA membership are still solo practices, as Frank was pointing out earlier, uh, most of the work goes to large firms. Well, how do you assign responsibility? Uh, in a large firm. Who in a large organization uh, can uh, really be in a position uh, to call the tune and stand up for, for, uh, for uh, architecture? It's the problem, as we say, of whistleblowing. I don't know if you have that term here. Who, who's going to blow the whistle uh, in the bureaucratic process to make sure that <coughs> That uh, architecture and the urban environment is is um, is is um, is protected and and cared for. I don't know the answer. I must say, I, I, I wish I did. And I, I find discussions of this um, both useful and agonizing, and that they reveal the fundamental dilemma. But I think the hopeful thing is that uh, what they also indicate, at least to me, is that we're all searching, that we recognize the problem. We, we recognize that the solution of Team 10 and the independent group didn't provide the answer. Uh, we certainly, in terms of American experience, realize that uh, the postmodern ideology of letting it take care of itself doesn't provide the answer. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore, in a sense, well, I, I see us as in a kind of transitional period, and the hope is that through discussions like this and through our recognition uh, that uh, the Team 10 answer and then the postmodern answer uh, uh, haven't worked, that gradually we will develop uh, a set of attitudes and positions to cope effectively with this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for contributing. Uh, I think it's been an extremely enlightening evening, and uh, I, I think we should uh, think very carefully about what Rob said. So thank you very much. And